Um, thank you very much. Um, welcome to King's College London for the uh, Freeman Air and Space Institute summer lecture uh, on space and sustainability and what does it mean and what can the UK do. And we're delighted this evening that um, the Right Honourable Lord David Willits has kindly agreed to speak to us about this uh, topic uh, tonight. So my name is Wynne Bowen. I'm one of two co-directors of the Freeman Air and Space Institute and a faculty member in the Department of War Studies. And my partner in crime, the other co-director, David Jordan from Defence Studies at King's is, is, is sitting over there and will participate in the events this evening too. Um, fire exits are there and there. There are no planned tests, I don't believe. Um, the restrooms are to the right-hand side. If the alarm goes, just follow one of us and we'll, we'll, we'll get you out of the, the building safely. Um, before I hand over to my colleague, Julia Baum, who's going to introduce uh, Lord Willits this evening, um, <coughs> if you'll indulge me, just a few quick um, words about the Freeman Institute. So we're part of the School of Security Studies here at King's College London, and we were established in 2000 thanks to a generous, uh, uh, generous funding uh, from the Royal Air Force through the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. We're an independent organisation. We seek to inform policy, doctrinal and scholarly debates related to air and space uh, in what is a rapidly evolving strategic environment, characterised, of course, by transformative technological change. Uh, we place a priority on identifying, developing, and cultivating air and space thinkers in academia, in industry, in government, uh, and within the armed forces, uh, as well as seeking to inform and equip air and space education provision at King's, but also uh, elsewhere. Um, and as part of that, we're also dedicated to widening participation in the air and space field, and we've got some significant plans in that area that we're currently developing. We hold regular events, like, like the one this evening, and we published the Freeman paper series, which is available on, on the King's website as well. Uh, there are quite a few of us, few of us from FASI here tonight. If you want to talk about FASI a bit more, come and talk to us um, at the reception later on. Uh, and we'd be happy to talk about what we do and if you want to get involved, uh, and so on and so forth. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to one of the future aerospace thinkers, uh, my colleague, Julia, or my, one of our doctoral students at the college who's going to introduce our speaker. Well, it's a great honor to introduce the Right Honorable uh, Lord David Willits as the speaker for the FASI summer event. On a topic like space sustainability and UK space policy, his expertise and years spent building up government support for UK space power certainly provides us with incredible insight. After serving as Member of Parliament for Havent from 1992 to 2015, as Minister for Universities and Science from 2010 to 2014, He's currently the chair of the UK Space Agency, president of the Resolution Foundation, board member of UKRI, and a visiting professor here at King's College London. He's written widely on economic and social policy. His book, A University Education, makes a compelling case for the ongoing importance of the university. And in his book, The Pinch, it explores how the baby boomer generation has attained peak position at the expense of their children. I could continue with many more accolades, but I think it's time to allow enough space to answer the pressing questions posed for this evening. What does space sustainability even mean, and what can the UK do about it? So I'll pass it off to you. Well, great. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to be here. I'm uh, delighted to be with you. Uh, I'm a great admirer of the work which the Freeman Institute does, and I particularly appreciate it because Julia has been my parliamentary intern helping out uh, with my research on space policy over the past year through the link to FASI. So it is, and the wider association with King's, because I'm a visiting professor attached to the Policy Institute. It's great to see Professor Bobby Duffy here from the, the Policy Institute. So I feel I have lots of ties and connections with King's, and it's um, a great uh, a privilege, therefore, to be able to be here and speak with you. Um, and of course, I've been involved with in space policy for a long time, both as the minister, then in various commercial roles, including being on the board of Surrey Satellites. I think there's a group of old colleagues from Surrey Satellites here, um, and now chairing the space agency. Uh, and I wanted to give a tiny up account of where we are, and what our priorities are in the space agency, and then particularly focus on sustainability. Uh, and I think in the space agency, we are increasingly launching programs that enable us to deliver the priority objectives which we have set out, of course, guided by the department and by ministers. In fact, just today, 
uh, we announced another tranche of funding to boost propulsion imaging and solar technologies, which is actually part of our committed £70 million National Space Innovation Programme. So our programmes of intervention to uh, promote the UK space sector are gaining pace and gaining resource. In terms of the kind of framework of policy as I see it, the, the priorities and the responsibilities we have to discharge the space agency, I'll give you a very brief list. I do put at the top of my list um, space discovery, space exploration, the sheer excitement of scientific advance through, sci uh, through space-based activities. And I always remember the wide, wise words of my friend Jean-Jacques Dordain, the, the former Director General of the European Space Agency. Um, because both when I was a minister and more recently serving on, as an expert advisor to ESA, you sit on these groups and turn up and say to the Director General, we really want to see more applied to private investment, promoting the private business sector in Europe. We've got to be business facing. And Jean-Jacques reminds me that he was always being told as Director General that that was what his priority was. He said, why is it therefore that the only requests I get to meet a head of government from one of ESA's member states is when we've done something particularly exciting in space discovery? Why is it it's when we're landing on a comet that I get asked to come in and brief the Prime Minister of various countries? Doesn't this tell us something about the underlying excitement and significance of space discovery and space exploration? So it's right to have that uh, at the top of the list. Second, and this is something very relevant for the Freeman uh, Institute, um, the second thing is, certainly for the UK, doing better at linking our civil and security space programs. Uh, because I think, for me, I would observe in the past 10 years probably the most significant change in R&D policy and space policy has been the rise of the security interest and the extent to which it is now directly engaged with and influencing wider policy. <coughs> Uh, I'm bringing out next week with Policy Exchange a 10-year on update and review of the eight great technologies that I identified in 2013. And it's an opportunity for me to just to reflect on what's changed. And there was a time when technologies and key technologies went out of fashion. What has brought them back and made them prominent in the government's agenda is the security angle and the security concern and the, uh, the Office of Science and Technology, many of the people there have a security background, and we observe in space policy the importance of um, space as a security uh, domain as well. And it's striking, if you got, get to what is probably the most important stage of science and technology policy of the last few years, namely the integrated review, it begins with the, with, it sets out four objectives, and the first is, and I quote, sustaining strategic advantage through science and technology. And goes on, we will incorporate science and technology as an integral element of our national security and international policy, fortifying the position of the UK as a global science and technology and responsible cyber power. So that is the second important feature of our environment, that, that link to the security agenda. Um, third is levelling up, and uh, that we're very fortunate in having a kind of spine of space activities that uh, go stretch across the country, but it's really important, and one can again sense the priority behind this, that we have, uh, we recognise that uh, funding and programmes have to extend beyond the southeast and indeed again recent activity just launched the government fund to build space infrastructure 50 million pound fund we're looking for co-funding with um, space partners what do we say more than half of that fund has to be spent outside the southeast and with a space mine going from uh, the the southwest 
um, right up to Scotland, it really should be something that we can do. So that's another key part of the framework. Fourth priority is just space to harness interest in STEM. And again, I found increasingly that the Department for Education, who themselves are preoccupied with STEM subjects, see space as a great way of interesting and engaging people in STEM education. And again, showing that we are at the Space Agency aware and sensitive to this agenda, just launched the Space to Learn program, which will channel over four million pounds of Space Agency funding into major educational projects, and that's fourth. Then, Fifth on my list is the international agenda. And of course, ESA is absolutely at the top of that, and you'll all be familiar with ESA, and um, it is a key agency. There was, I guess, post-Brexit. Uh, there were some, I think there were some people in government who thought we'd left ESA. But no, we are absolutely committed to it. It's an intergovernmental body, and George Freeman and the team did a fantastic job at the ESA ministerial last autumn. So it's a key partner. But what we have definitely added is a set of strong bilateral relationships with key partners around the world in space. And we now have a modest amount of money that we can put into those partnerships. We've just been allocating some of the first 20 million pounds that we've got. And some things stand out. NASA, our relationship with NASA is more significant than ever. And definitely NASA themselves are interested in promoting international partnerships. Uh, there's a lot happening there. I will talk later on about particularly the, the Moon to Mars agenda, but bilateral links to NASA. We had space as one of the items on the agenda for the bilateral between the Prime Minister and the President the other week. And we, can, uh, we are doing particular projects with them. Today, uh, this lunchtime, I hosted a lunch with the head of JAXA. Japan is another key partner where relationships are growing, and uh, probably asterisk, the asterisk scale investment is one of the biggest single items of public expansion on space we've seen, and it's yielding a, an originally Japanese company heavily engaged here. Um, and other bilateral relationships as well, Australia springs to mind. So a recognition, I think emerging from the integrated review, that space is an area where we can forge bilateral partnerships for a Brexit grid. Um, and then for us in the space agency, last but absolutely not least on that list, is promoting private investment. And this is where there is still a degree of tension between our role as a civil commercial agency and the security angle. And the security angle, which you can see um, influencing research, and it's no bad thing, what's the, is there a requirement? Uh, is one of the questions that all my friends on the defence and security side, what's the requirement? And then the integrated, refuse question, um, uh, own, collaborate, access. Those are ways in which you approach space if you are thinking of it as a national resource to be allocated to meeting specific national requirements. If you come at it from a more commercial angle, sometimes people will have got an idea and there'll be an, an entrepreneur somewhere in the world who's built up a space business and that may not immediately tie in to a UK national requirement. And it may not necessarily lend itself to an analysis of own, collaborate, or access. But this is a growing, successful, innovative company. And if we make the right offer, we may be able to attract them to engage in some of their activities in the UK. And if we have an aim of promoting private investment, private activity, private R&D, we don't need to try to work out if we have a national requirement before we just try to encourage them to set up in the UK. So the, the civil way of thinking is still a bit different from the security way. Not that one is right and not wrong, but they are just different. And that for us is the distinctive value above all we add. We are seeking to promote private investment from major UK-based companies and always trying to attract more uh, here to the UK as well. So there's, there's a kind of review of our the framework within which we operate. I'd like to pick out now three um, kind of distinct opportunities which have particularly caught my eye, which are sort of hot for us at the moment. Doesn't, it's not an exclusive list, but you can't cover everything. 
and I'd just like to refer to three. One is the Leo constellation opportunity, which for us in Britain, above all, means one web. I was one of the advocates of the government taking the stake in OneWeb. It's sometimes referred to as a bankrupt company as if it was a terrible failure. It wasn't that it had failed. It was that SoftBank, its long-term investor, didn't have the resource to carry on investing in the way that the company had expected. So my view was we had a, a commercially viable UK headquartered company delivering uh, one of the world's few Leo constellations. And this was a fantastic national asset which we should invest in. And of course, after the UK government invested, uh, Indian investors and others came in. I still think it's a significant opportunity for the UK, and it's now being crystallized, first of all, by the need for them to start planning Gen 2, the next generation of their satellites. And it would be great to see as much as possible of the supply side for their Gen 2 satellites for companies active in the UK and Gen and doing the work in the UK, that will be ultimately a decision for OneWeb, but obviously we're trying to ensure that British businesses and batch fit and able to take as much as possible of that advantage. And then we'll also see how its relationship with the EU and UTELSAT plays out. I am still sufficiently naive and optimistic to dream of OneWeb being seen as the European constellation, the European Leo constellation. Um, kind of matching what they already have in that fantastic asset in Galileo. But I fully realize that that involves uh, tricky issues for the EU about us now as a third country, issues about the, the golden share. And at the moment, the EU are insisting that they're going to have some other uh, offer, some other entity separate from one one. But we'll see how that plays out. But I still think there is um, an opportunity there for one web to be an important EU asset. So Leo Constellation we, was the first on my list. The second on my list is Launch. Um, and indeed, uh, I, as I engage in my update uh, of the pamphlet I did 10 years ago for Policy Exchange on the eight great technologies, and reread it with the purpose of trying to find out if my speculations about these eight great technologies had in any way stood the test of time, or whether they had just proved how technology foresight was an impossibly difficult activity. I still remember as a boy watching that great James Bond film, I think it's Thunderball, where he uh, rides his jetpack. Um, and I think as a boy, when I first saw the film, I envisaged that by the time I was this age, I would be commuting to the office with my personal jetpack. Instead, I either take the train or cycle. Two excellent 19th century technologies, which David Edgerton reminds us, are, <coughs> it's often the old technologies that carry on for longest. So the question is, does the eight great technologies uh, list just look like eight examples of the hopes of the jetpack that weren't fulfilled? Um, and my analysis out next week is a bit more optimistic than that. And reading my discussion of space, and particularly satellites, the chapter entitled Satellites and Commercial Applications of Space, um, that I was pleased that one of the things I observed, and I think this was the first time it's been said by a British minister, is that there are opportunities for the UK to host a spaceport if we get the regulatory framework correct. So that is now at last beginning to happen, and it was very sad uh, the, uh, what happened to Virgin, and of course it was a great pity that that mission uh, did not ultimately succeed. However, it was at least a test of the things that the government needed to get in place, and there is a legislative framework for space launch, and there is a CAA responsibility, and it was discharged, and the launch happened, and that puts us in, I think, a very good position for, as we hope, to see vertical launch thriving quite possibly from two different locations, both in, in Scotland, both in Shetland, and in Sutherland, and both are moving ahead vigorously, and you will know the opportunities for launching north into polar orbit over ocean from well-designed launch sites with a regulatory regime that's up to date and available, and our regulatory regime is still ahead of that of anything else in Europe. So I think launch remains an exciting strategic opportunity for the UK. 
And then third on my list is Luna and beyond, where the all of us who go to the US now have got a very clear sense that after years when the US was agonizing and not quite clear what to do and didn't see the point of going back to the moon, they'd been there, done that, and it was now going to be for other people to go. There's a clear, you can sense now, there's a clear and deep-seated strategy of getting back to the moon and using that as a base for them going on to Mars. And they are very serious about it. The UK has not played any significant role in lunar activity uh, over the first 50 years, but that is now changing. This, I think the next decade will clearly show far more lunar activity than in the previous 50 years put together. And there are niche opportunities for the UK. It's great that the UK and Italy are working together on, on a lunar pathfinder, lunar gateway, that we're going to see some, see some opportunities there. And I observed when I was last in Washington talking to the head of NASA that they've got a very clear sense of some distinct UK uh, assets. We have, there's first of all, through a series of um, uh, accidents which I don't fully understand, but it does look as if we have a nuclear isotope, uh, americium-241, that is particularly well suited because of its half-life, being used to power nuclear, uh, it could be to power a nuclear base, it's more likely to be powering long-term missions. The Americans certainly don't want us to see, want to see the journey to Mars quicker than two years. They, need, they know it needs to be powered. And our supplies at Sellafield, because of the form of AGRs that we had in the UK, which for a long time has been categorized as waste, it certainly turned out that our supplies of americium-241 in our nuclear waste is something that the Americans are very interested in indeed, and that is an opportunity for us. Um, then there's, of course, Rolls-Royce's expertise in micro reactors, which looks like uh, something that could be very relevant for helping to power a lunar base. So there are, in particular areas, interesting and constructive conversations going on where NASA thinks that the UK has a role to play in their ambitions for getting to the moon and beyond, as well, of course, as the fantastic work that's been done on Rosalind Franklin and Mars Sat for sample return. So third on my list of kind of current hot priorities is making sure that as the US returns to the moon and many other advanced countries go to the moon for the first time, the UK carves out a creative and important role for itself, contributing to the missions and playing a role in the lunar economy. So I've tried to give you a quick review of both the kind of framework within which we operate in the space agency and two or three of the hot topics at the moment. And now, like in the final part of my talk, to take a few steps back and, and kind of look beyond all this to kind of what the point is of it all. And of course, I've already touched on some of them, the, the, the excellence and excitement of, of discovery through space, the security concern, space is the ultimate high ground, the economic opportunity from everything from Leo constellations to the lunar economy, and the, and the sheer usefulness of space delivered services. And that's really the key to what I wanted to talk about in the final part of my speech, which is the role of space in tackling the biggest challenge we face, which is the climate emergency and uh, ensuring that life on Earth, human life on Earth, is sustainable and manageable, which um, excessive global heating makes very difficult indeed. And course, there are some classic roles already. There's first of all the increasing importance of space just in monitoring what is happening. The truth mission will uh, enable us to have even more accurate measurements of uh, global warming uh, and uh, climate change against the background of solar activity than has been possible in the past. And I was delighted that, again, there's another initiative just in the last few weeks with the satellite applications catapult. Uh, we've been able to uh, fund GHGSAT with their activities here. And I think it's great that we've been able to 
find a way in which that will enable methane monitoring from space, but not generic across Earth. They've now got the technologies that enable them to link methane to particular large-scale installations. And at that point, when you can track releases to particular installations, suddenly real monitoring of um, uh, climate change and use of that kind of information in green finance, funding for installations with low levels of emissions, uh, penalizing installations, which the measures show got high levels of emissions, all that becomes more possible. So every, almost every month that passes, the capacity of space-based data really to get granular information about the drivers of climate change becomes ever greater. And then using space-based assets actually, actually to help tackle climate change. And here, of course, is the exciting <coughs> of another initiative which we are helping to fund and support from the space agency, namely space-based solar power. I think space-based solar power has gone from the realms of the highly speculative and rather eccentric to being increasingly recognized as potentially very useful indeed. Linked in to advances in technology and robotic assembly in space, but I think space-based solar power um, has got a real contribution to make, at least as serious as nuclear fusion and probably on a much tighter timetable, being available in the time that's needed to provide green and reliable energy sources. So space tackling the climate emergency, not just monitoring it. Uh, that's what, uh, that, and, and so space can contribute to the sustainability agenda on Earth. But, all of us who care about space and the space sector, space research and the space industry, will know that we will just be seen as total hypocrites if whilst we say we can use space to monitor climate change and contribute to, to sustainability on Earth, we do so in such an ill-conceived, short-termist, messy way that we make space activities themselves unsustainable. We can't preach sustainability for Earth and not practice it in space. And that is a challenge that I think we need to address. We, if we want to try to protect the environment on Earth, we also need have an obligation to protect the environment in space. And space has contributed massively to an awareness of the vulnerabilities of planet Earth. One thinks of those wonderful images from the early Apollo missions showing planet Earth. But we also need to think of what the space environment around Earth looks like now. Um, and that's why I know uh, ministers and the government attaches such importance to space sustainability. It means the, the growing and acute risk from space debris. It means the uh, importance of proper plans for satellite deorbiting. It means uh, ensuring that we do not lose access to some key orbits just because the amount of space debris makes them unusable. And that, I think, is a real risk. We don't know how much of a risk it is, because we haven't even properly researched it. But it is a real risk. And I think the problem is partly that lay people, such as myself, start off with a picture of space as big and infinite and pristine and pure. Well, when you are start thinking about orbits and space debris, it's not at all clear that orbits around the, around the Earth really are such a large space. As soon as you allow for the speed at which every object moves, which increases significantly the chance of a collision, as soon as you factor in the speed at which objects move, suddenly low Earth orbits don't look so big and spacey. After all, they begin to look a bit more like the M25. And the challenge of understanding the risks of collision and what we should do about it and the risks of, of um, 
parts of the uh, of some of those orbits becoming unusable is very real indeed. And the uh, if you look at simply the plans that Elon Musk has, that the Chinese have, for the amount of small satellites in low Earth orbit over the next few years, which could be a step change in the amount of satellite activity in low Earth orbit, clearly going up into tens of thousands. One estimate I had, and of course not all of these plans will come to pass, but one of the estimates I saw was on the basis simply of stated plans to construct satellite constellations. We could be talking of 100,000 uh, satellites in low Earth orbit over the next decade or so. Then everything we've previously assumed about easy access to space uh, ceases to apply. And there is a real risk. You only need one or two more collisions with the exponential um, increase in debris. And of course, as we all know, then potentially triggering further collisions to realize that we're running a very significant risk. And the second issue is, of course, how pristine is space? Um, we're sending quite a lot of stuff up. And as we rediscover the moon, um, we should just remind ourselves uh, that so far we have left on the moon approximately 400,000 pounds in weight of, man, of uh, material instrumentation of, and kit. We have left approximately 70 different satellites and other space devices. We've left 96 bags of human waste. We have left, we have left uh, I think, several golf balls. <coughs> uh, we've left a variety of plaques recording our presence. And I think for us in the UK in particular, all this brings to my mind certain parallels with how we approach human exploration on Earth and some of the assumptions we had about what belonged to Western powers as we discovered parts of Africa and Australia, and only very late on began to think about what our responsibilities were for these places and when they were just untouched wilderness where we had an absolute right to do with them as we wished. So this is where I, I think space policy starts also opening up some quite deep questions in space philosophy about what claims we have, what obligations we have, whether we can uh, blithely leave this stuff on the moon. Um, uh, we have left organisms on the moon by accident or design. I think the Israeli mission that left uh, organisms on the moon, those uh, tardigrade with potentially very long uh, uh, lives indeed, is that, uh, that there is no real regulatory model, I mean, because there's no real moral compass that sets out what we should do. And uh, we in Britain, I think, do have an opportunity and a responsibility. When it comes to space debris, um, if there's any area of law that's most relevant, it's maritime law. And we all know that maritime law on salvage has developed over centuries. And Britain, play, as the main naval power for many years, played a dominant role in the development of the maritime legal system. Is it hopeless to imagine that some of that could be applied in space? Um, there is uh, a, the most pristine part of Earth uh, which was, being, was going to be subject to various territorial claims was the Antarctic. Britain played a key role in the formulation of the Antarctic Treaty, trying to define how different powers, uh, it was a kind of permanent truce, it froze, that's the right word to use, it, it, it froze various national claims and agreed rules about what activities that should or should not happen in Antarctica. Can we learn anything from the negotiations around the Antarctic treaties that we can apply to the moon just when the race to get there is beginning? Uh, what are the moral frameworks behind this? One of the reasons why Britain has a very successful biotech industry, it's not just the scientists and the technologists and the medics, wonderful though they are, but that very early on, a moral philosopher, Mary Warnock, was asked to write a moral framework for human fertilization and embryology. 
which is the basis for a regulatory regime that has proved to be well respected and effective and has been the basis for a lot of subsequent biotech work. Um, it's not, is it too far-fetched to think that we need that kind of thinking about our responsibilities, both for low Earth orbits and for the moon now, before we find it is just total chaos and anarchy out there. So what uh, I hope is that as well as considering these as exciting scientific and technological issues, we will also realize that there is some deeper thinking required about that has to be the fundamental bedrock on which any kind of uh, agreed international framework for these activities rests. And that's, for me, what the sustainability agenda ultimately means. Of course, it's practical activities, monitoring climate change, uh, trying to uh, contribute to clean sources of energy. It is also trying to provide a shared moral framework about what our obligations are to maintain the condition of our planet and what our moral framework is for maintaining the condition of the space around us and the moon. Uh, and if I may say so, um, I think these kind of messages are getting through. And um, I'm delighted that next week, for example, King Charles, uh, who was probably in the past skeptical of some of this, King Charles is hosting an event around Astra Carta, an attempt to agree international standards on what sustainable use of space could be. So I look forward to the continuing excitement of the technological advances, the growth of the UK space sector, but I think also we have a distinctive contribution and responsibility for thinking very rigorously about how we discharge those responsibilities, not just for our nation, but globally. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now open uh, to questions. Could I please ask um, you to identify yourself, and this particularly applies to those who are asking questions online. Uh, my colleague Ray will be taking the questions online and feeding them into the, um, into the discussion. Uh, it becomes very difficult to distinguish whether anonymous is one or 16 different people, whether it's somebody hogging all the questions or not. So please, if you're online, make sure we know who you are. Um, we will try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, but first of all, I'll throw you open to the room for me. Yes, there, please. Thank you very much. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm, I'm now really a journalist. I've been doing a lot of reporting on the Ukraine war, and I also uh, warned people, shoved a book across the table, uh, nine years ago to certain people and said, please read this. Um, so um, my question reflects my previous work as an intelligence analyst in law enforcement, joining up the dots. Um, are there any particular procedures or technologies where you think things are pretty well arranged now within the UK and with partners I can see your smile. You, you've already worked out what's coming. Um, to properly utilize these technologies, in, order, in other words, the organization and the people, or are there areas where there's a danger opportunities could be delayed because we haven't got the A to Z? We're only about A to M now. Thanks. Well, as I said, I do think the, um, the legislation five years ago or so now on space launch uh, is still putting us as an advantage. There was, a, there was a kind of mini European space race underway and we, and the Norwegians and the Swedes and everyone, but I think um, our regulatory regime and the CAA's role uh, does give us an advantage. Uh, and I would say, secondly, uh, and the and the uh, the minister George Freeman is very interested in this. Uh, the whole um, regulation uh, 
uh, as launch state of um, new satellites and where we've got a very delicate balance. We don't have to be sort of so heavy-handed that people just go and use a different launch state. On the other hand, I think we can expect proper standards on deorbiting and things like that. And again, my impression from over in the US is some of the US regulators would now say, except in private, they were slow to cotton on to some of the issues around the, the speed at which Elon Musk has, has launched satellites. And they hadn't really got fully into thinking about deorbit arrangements and such like. And um, I think some of them rather regret they didn't do a bit more advanced thinking about what was a reasonable regulatory requirement to him. So I don't want to sound complacent, but those, those are some areas where I think we are in a, in a quite a good position. But why do, and on debris, well that is, that's been so frustrating. But even though we have tried to play a constructive role, when I, when I was the minister, I could see coming up, we'd got the 50th anniversary of the original Outer Space Treaty. And of course, interestingly, we are one of the first three signatories. After the USA and the USSR, we are the third signatory, the guarantor power. So I did ask around amongst the, in the government machine, is there any, was there any point our convening a 50th anniversary of the Outer Space Treaty conference to try to update it? And already relations between the USA and Russia, as it had become, were so bad that people said, there's no way an official conference is gonna get anywhere. However, informally, through the United Nations, through um, building coalitions and consensus, we've made quite a lot of progress in the UN, even without, even when the great, the great power tensions are as, as bad as ever. So I think we can play a constructive role. Thank you. Um, yes, gentlemen there, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, James Campbell from, I, I guess, Biosat, <laughs> as, of, as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, uh, question, you talked about three opportunity areas, your first one being LEO um, technologies, and you talked at the end about space sustainability being the elephant in the room, and we're, you know, we're maybe even past a, a crisis point there as well. Um, I guess, you know, two questions. One, would you consider that there could be an, an opportunity from a sustainable LEO approach in the U UK. So not considering LEO as, as upside and, and space sustainability as a sort of a difficult thing to try and manage over here, but thinking about making the next generation of sustainable LEO space technologies, recognizing that in a few years, maybe after there's been some event or, or maybe after there's some sort of a consensus, there will be a, a, you know, a demand for you know, low polluting cars in space, if we can think of it like that. And the UK might be very well um, positioned and the second point is, um, you, you talked about the link between space sustainability and uti utilization of space and um, climate change monitoring on Earth. But there's an emerging area, MIT and others are looking at it, of space environmentalism, where they're looking at the potential effect of ablation of these satellites in the upper atmosphere. Um, and their view is they don't know what the effect is. Mm -hmm. um, but given that, um, it's an increasingly a volatile uh, chemical system up there. A precautionary principle might well be something that could have some merit to it. Um, and they're also concerned yeah. about the fundamental unpredictability of return to yeah. Earth, um, particularly when you have more and more satellites going up. How, how do you think about those matters? Yeah, uh, and look, I, I think um, uh, they're both very fair questions. And, um, and, I'm, and, and the truth is that they are, um, in, in, they are increasingly on the agenda, and of course, although I I put you know, I put one web's satellites are significantly higher in orbit. Yeah, they're the, not, they're not yeah, yeah. So the so one issue is when we say Leo, how low does it go, and how and obviously the lower you are, and so the narrower your swath, the more you need, and are, are there trade-offs here that when which getting up. Um, uh, higher towards a, a thousand kilometers is completely uh, different and advantageous. And there's also interesting ideas around, of course, of, of linking Leo and Mio and uh, creating other kinds of constellation that don't, doesn't require an incredible density of um, uh, satellites in very low Earth orbit. Uh, and then secondly, yes, this is why I'm so reminded of the painful lessons 
from uh, Western um, exploration and empire building in, in the 19th century. Uh, now, again, I'm a lay person. I'm only reporting what I read. I do not have the capacity to reach a critical assessment of it. Um, but people who make observations such as um, Elon Musk is saying that if the astronomers are worried about his satellites affecting their ability to do astronomy, he's going to paint them all black and then it's going to be okay. Um, one question they've started asking is, well, what are exactly are the chemicals in all this black paint he's suddenly going to start using? And what, in turn, do they have any impact? And what's, what's, going, to ha what's going to happen to that? And has anybody thought about the amount of chemical that is being going to be used in this way? So there are all those type of questions uh, where I do think the space community has been very cavalier in the past. And we can't, just like the world is getting focused on sustainability, and people start thinking, what is the complete design life of this motor car or this computer, we don't just have to say space is the solution to the Earth's problems. We have to think much more rigorously about the complete design life and the functioning of stuff we're sending up into space or putting on the moon. Uh, thank you. Anxious to make sure we don't ignore our Sorry, yeah. line. Um, uh, sure. Ray. Uh, Given the issues of space debris and the need to be able to both look up as well as down from space. How do you, what are your thoughts on deep space advanced radar capability being planned for a UK location, which certainly can contribute to leveling up? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are various opportunities um, around. I think the UK can play a um, constructive role, I think, um, uh, that idea at the moment is pretty speculative, so there's not much more I can add about it. But yeah, the UK, these are capacities that, if they do make sense, we should develop. Thank you. Um, any more questions in the room? Uh, yes, gentleman over there, please. Thank you. I'm a student here uh, of War Studies at King's, and uh, I'd like to ask slightly uh, outside of the scope of sustainability, but uh, given how much cooperation there's been uh, in the space affairs, uh, in the case of the European Union, is there any desire or actual uh, inertia in the UK now towards uh, space cooperation in the Commonwealth? Uh, after all, Canada and Australia are both uh, rather involved in the, uh, in the space exploration, and there are countries that would certainly be willing to cooperate with the UK uh, on that matter. So is there any move towards that, or is that a, something to be said later? Thank you. Um, yes, I think there is. Um I mean, there, there, uh, first of all, there's, there's more widely, there is undoubtedly an effort going into Commonwealth scientific collaboration uh, and a revitalization of the network of Commonwealth universities. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a pity in a way that it required Brexit for this time. These are things that could have happened anyway, but the truth is they have been energized by the experience of Brexit, and it's great that we're putting more effort into those type of relationships. And then the Five Eyes community, although Five Eyes, kind of the, the legally tight arrangements are in certain um, quite defined areas of intelligence cooperation and cybersecurity, um, there is a growing informal space Five Eyes network and you can um, see that growing. And then finally, AUKUS, which I think someone has already referred to. AUKUS is not just a submarine program. It is also a framework for potential future collaboration in other technologies. And there is a genuine question, therefore, about the extent to which the AUKUS Treaty could be a framework for collaboration between the UK, Australia, and the US um, on space technologies. It may not there yet, it may not happen, but that is, it's certainly now there is a legal framework where that could be possible. Thank you, we'll take another one from in the room and then go um, back online. Um, down at the front, please, here. Hi, Ali Gray, uh, 20 years at Inmosat, before it was Viasat and now at PA Consulting. So thinking about two of the jewels in the crown of the UK space industry, one being Inmosat, now Vi Viasat, and then the other one being the small but very shiny jewel of OneWeb and potentially Utilsat. If we went glass half empty on that, we could think about those two entities as taking flight from the UK potentially. But if we think about it as glass half full, are there opportunities for the UK government to think of those two ent entities as 
a route into international collaboration commercially? Yeah, I mean, I think they are both great assets. And look, I have been, uh, I mean, the, the, the deal has all has now gone through, and I have um, uh, got to know Mark Dankberg of, of uh, Viasat, and he has made very significant undertakings to, uh, as part of the agreed deal. Um, and I do think Mark Dankberg, I've, um, yeah, I've got him up there alongside sort of Martin Sweeting as one of the people um, who've been in the business for a very long time and do think very strategically. And he's certainly um, very exercised about the space debris sustainability agenda. And that's not solely because he's comp in competition with Elon Musk. Uh, so I think, and of course, we are hoping and expecting that there will be uh, Viasat. I mean, they brought in Marsat for a reason, they, and they clearly have ambitious plans and commitments on centers of excellence in the UK and such like. So I think that has great potential. And, and Mark is quite eloquent about the sort of in Marsat's history and understanding and valuing its history and understanding its origins as a, as a, as a global service. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, and then for OneWeb, we will see the, the, the Utilsat deal is, is, is not as far down the track as the, as the Viasat deal. Um, we will see. Um, what it brings home to me is that it would be great if we had some kind of wider defense and security framework between us and the EU. Because um, at that point, some of the obstacles, which I referred to in my talk, I don't need to repeat them, some of the obstacles. Um, uh, become much less of a problem. And I, as I say, my dream, I hope was optimistic in all this, is for, the, for European countries, and of course it would begin with France, with Utilsat, seeing OneWeb as their Leo Constellation asset, with crucial, and the asset is partly just some basic, obvious things like spectrum. Uh, and so, I can, I can see a future constructive negotiation, but it's nothing like as far advanced as what's happened with Wiser. Thank you. Uh, Ray, any uh, questions? Yes, from um, to place? piggyback off of what you just said, um, the ESA has begun using the term European strategic autonomy in the last year or so. How do you see the UK responding to this new philosophy at the ESA? Will the UK support the idea of European strategic autonomy, autonomy in space? Well, um, I think this ESA high level report is very interesting and a challenge. I mean, it's a think piece and um, it's certainly not yet been uh, endorsed. Mm -hmm. uh, and setting aside UK, the UK, I mean, I think my reading of the German comments have been, how do we pay for all this already? So there's going to be a lively debate about it. But it does, it brings home um, the endless kind of UK, both opportunity and dilemma, both having a special relationship with the US, but also a partner with Europe through uh, our membership of the visa. I can, if you don't have the US strategic umbrella quite as closely as we have with the special relationship. I understand why strategic autonomy matters. And I, the folklore that I heard, and there's probably someone in this room who can correct me, but the folklore I heard about the origins of Galileo was the following exchange at a conference in Brussels in the 1990s when the visiting US general responsible for GPS, which is ultimately a US military system, was asked by a uh, European, can you guarantee that in all circumstances, EU states will always have access to GPS? To which he replied, no comment. Um, and the, so the, that's when, if you, if you don't, you start thinking about what are your capabilities and what do you need. And I thought, I understand why Europe thinks like that. Um, I think it's very ambitious to imagine you could go from what our current capacities are to the sort of full-blown model at anything like what looks to me like a pleasantly modest cost in that high-level group. I remember thinking that the pricing looked a little bit low, and you may have to prioritize. 
but starting to try to add some other specific capabilities might be a direction of travel for, for Europe. Thank you. We're entering the uh, last few minutes. Sorry, Could, yeah. uh, there, please. Sorry, Aaron, give you a tricky <laughs> trek with the microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Felicity Box. I'm an MBA student down the road at Imperial College. Um, and I just wanted to talk about, um, I think you've, you've likened kind of the problem of the space environment and orbit environment to the climate environment here on Earth. And um, in the kind of climate change fight, there are three strategies of avoidance, mitigation, and adaptation. Um, and I wanted to get your take on whether you think that the rate of innovation in those three areas in tackling the space debris problem is keeping pace with the growth in the total number of space-based assets that are going up there. And if it's not, what can we do to accelerate that rate of innovation? Yeah. Um, and here, I think a, and again, this is, this is a parallel with the green debate on Earth. There's, there's, the, there's new satellites and old stuff. So one thing to try to do is to make sure everything we put up from now on You've got a proper deorbiting strategy. You know what's going to happen. You've got that plan. And that is a, a, a minimal requirement, which, let's face it, we are not currently meeting. It's not clear that the Chinese proposed constellation meets those requirements. It's not clear that Leon, Elon Musk is meeting those requirements. There is separately, then, what you do with the stuff up there. And obviously, for that, you've both got mitigation by much more sophisticated tracking, um, plus trying to deorbit, but to deorbit, you need both a set of technological advances and you need some regulations around sending up something that gets very close to something else in space, which is manifestly dual use. And again, the, the, British, the classic British perspective, which we're very keen on, is um, uh, having an operational regime, agreed controls. If you try to look at minimizing the risk of conflict emerging from space-based activities, something so that you could signal if you send up something into space that starts getting very close to other satellites and inspecting them, and what, that some system for registering what you're doing, for indicating what their purpose is. So as the world gets very turbulent and very dangerous with you know, different military powers, all this type of stuff, now we should be thinking, that's why I, I'm so pleased to be doing this with the Freeman Institute, that's the kind of thinking we need to ensure that incidents in space don't themselves become triggers of conflicts back on Earth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, time for one more. Um, Freddie. Uh, thank you, Lord Willits. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Freddie Laker. I'm a visiting fellow here at uh, Farsi. My question is really about, ultimately, technology is a social process. And the question is really about how do we sell this to the public? How do you sell space to a public? How, in, in terms of, you know, when you look at the social imagination of space, it comes primarily from science fiction films. But how do you sell something so intangible so far away from the day-to-day -day realities of the average Briton, especially now in the economic crisis, that they should be thinking about outer space when they're struggling to survive and live. I mean, the reason why I, I, I thought about this is as you were talking about technology, you know, we have, you know, supersonic technology. We had Concorde, and yet we mothballed it because it was just too expensive. It's a rich man's technology. And so that's really my mm. question to you in terms of mm. how you bring this down to the everyday person in our society. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I think on that, I mean, the starting point is the sheer usefulness of space. And it, we, we sometimes allow the excitement of it to get in the way of community just its usefulness and the, the more it manifests that you know, it's now, um, the services we need that depend on space. And it's so frustrating that it's seen as a rich man's toy, just like Concord, partly because of the personal wealth of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And I always try at, um, whenever I'm talking especially to fellow lay people about space, I say, don't think of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk as two rich billionaires playing games. Think of one guy who's got a network of cars and another guy who's got Alexa in more and more of our houses. They are, one of them is trying to ensure a completely integrated satellite-based system 
linking up all his cars. And the other one is trying to get an integrated satellite system for linking up all our houses. And there's a race on between them. These are not the idea it's some personal hobby is grossly to underestimate what they, as strategic thinkers in business, see as the purpose of having a satellite constellation. And then the second point that I was trying to make in my talk is some appeal to the moral instincts. And that's why um, the, and for me it's, it's uh, and it's a point that Tim Peake makes. It's the moment when the astronauts on the space station have to go and sit in the Soyuz capsule in case the debris is sufficiently, is so close that they need to make an emergency departure. And that is actually getting more frequent. Uh, it's the, and it's that kind of challenge. Uh, so uh, th those are the kind of ways I, tr I try to communicate. Yeah, and we can all do better, but I think that that's, instead of the slightly naive, glossy, it's just all so amazing and exciting. I think it's those type of points, usefulness, and as you rightly say, kind of moral framework, that for me as a former politician who had 20 plus years facing real constituents, that's how you actually communicate and get it home to people what some of this is about. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, um, well, I think we could probably quite easily go on for another sort of hour and a <laughs> half at this rate, but we must draw things to a close. Um, I'd like to start off with a few sort of general thanks. Thank you to uh, you all uh, for attending and to those online who joined us. And sorry we couldn't take uh, more of your questions. Thank you to Ray uh, in particular for fielding the questions. And uh, as a sign how busy she's been uh, before this, Orla, who's actually left to set up the next stage of things, our, um, our sort of uh, administrator and the person who keeps me in line and makes sure I end up in the right place at the right time. So thank you there for all those efforts. And thank um, you to Julia Barr, yeah. my parliamentary intern. And uh, I, I've been preempted there in th thanking uh, Julia. Also, thank you to Sophie and Aaron for uh, operating the microphones for us. However, our main uh, debt of gratitude, of course, is to our distinguished speaker tonight, Lord Willits. Thank you very much for giving so generously of your time and your thoughts. Uh, and just as a small token uh, of our appreciation, if I can actually do this in anything uh -huh. like an elegant manner, uh -huh. uh, a small token of our appreciation, <laughs> oh. and I uh, hope the oh. audience will join with me in thanking you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Very kind of you.